Hello everyone, welcome back to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be looking at thermal vias, whether or not they're actually effective and how many thermal vias should you use in your PCB footprints. Now this is a topic we haven't explored very much and I think most designers just take it as gospel that they should always use as many thermal vias as possible in their designs. I recently got a viewer question about this topic and there was an article that came out a couple years ago in iConnect suggesting that thermal vias are not as necessary as we think they are. So we're gonna look at all of this in this video. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Now the topic of this video is thermal vias, and thermal vias are vias that are used to connect the bottom die attached pad on some integrated circuit packages to an internal plane layer, normally a ground plane. Now this topic came to my attention from Marco Duxi, who you may remember as one of the submitters for our one minute design review series. Let's take a look at Marco's question. Now I have Marco's question here on screen and as you can see, it's quite a long question so I will summarize the important points. Marco is referencing an article in iConnect 007 from November 20th, 2023 and this article is titled, Your Thermal Designs Are Inefficient. He says it is a little bit of a clickbaity title and I would tend to agree, but basically the entire point of this article is that you should ditch thermal vias. Now in Marco's opinion, he says says there are no references to previous work and that the article lacks weight. And so I guess this is where I come in to take a second look at this article and see if we can reconcile the recommendations in this article with other recommendations that are out there in the literature. Now, when I first received this question, I had actually never read the article, but I do recall seeing the title in iConnect because of course I do get the daily newsletters from iConnect. So I decided to go back and read the iConnect article. I also did a little bit of digging in the literature to see if we could find any recommendations or analysis on the use of thermal vias. So let's go ahead and take a look at that iConnect article and really break down what it's saying. And then we can see what other recommendations are out there from the literature. And we can get a little better sense as to why some semiconductor manufacturers recommend using certain arrangements or patterns of thermal vias and paste mask openings in their footprints. Now here on screen, I have the iConnect article pulled up and this article, as I said earlier, is titled, Your Thermal Designs Are Inefficient. So the very first thing I think we need to do is really qualify what inefficient means in this context. Here I have the article pulled up on screen. You can see here we have the title, Your Thermal Designs Are Inefficient. This article is written by Douglas Brooks and Dr. Johannes Adam. And I think it's important to really qualify what the word inefficient Efficient means in this context. Now they say that the inefficiencies are unnecessarily taking up board area and blocking routing channels through the use of thermal vias. So basically they're saying something that I've actually identified in another video, which is that if you have too many thermal vias or you have those thermal vias closely spaced together, you can block areas that could be used for routing. They bring up three other points. Your high current carrying traces are probably too wide. And this is something that I actually talked about with Mike Jopi on an old podcast episode in relation to the IPC 2152 standard. They also mentioned you probably use too many vias in your high current carrying traces. Now, I know this is something that I've definitely been guilty of. They say, finally, any thermal vias that you use are probably worthless. Now in this article, they do several simulations and they're basically looking at what happens when you, for example, put planes below traces and pads. And then what happens when you take that plane or trace and you connect them with a thermal via. So let's take a look at each of these simulations in detail. Now here you can see in their first simulation, what they're doing is they are comparing two traces of different trace widths, but the same trace current. And they are looking at the traces without a ground plane beneath them and with a ground plane beneath them. And what you can see here is something that we actually talked about with Mike Jopi in the old podcast episode. When we have a trace with no ground plane at 150 52 degrees, the temperature of that trace drops down to 74 degrees when all we do is put a ground plane underneath the trace. Now, what's interesting here is that, of course, when you have a wide trace with no ground plane, it can have the same temperature as a narrow trace 
with a ground plane. And if you take that wide trace, you put a ground plane below it, you also get a temperature reduction as we would expect. Now I talked about this specific issue with Mike Jopi on an old episode of the Altium On Track podcast. In that episode, we were talking about his work on the IPC 2152 standard and why IPC 2221 is overly conservative. Let's take a look at a clip. There are certain more experienced designers than myself uh, who are well known, who have said that uh, things like copper planes and copper pour do absolutely nothing for thermal management. And you're saying that they're wrong and you have the data to prove it. Big time. <laughs> Big time. Well, copper is a thousand times more thermally conductive than the dielectric material. Well, of course. Well, yeah. How can it not impact the trace temperature rise? Now, the reason I bring up that clip is to illustrate that the simulation results in this article, as well as the author's uh, description of these simulation results, is actually not that far off at all from what Mike Jopi describes as the function of copper in a ground plane below a trace. We really are seeing something in the simulations that matches what's been observed in experiments. So, so far, so good for this article. Let's take a look at what happens when they add in a via on one of these traces. In their next simulation, the authors took two traces, one trace carrying current, and they connected the two traces using a via so that the current in one trace could transfer to the next trace. In doing so, some of the heat generated in one of the traces then, of course, would also transfer into the next trace. They used a single via, two vias, and then three vias for this connection, as you can see here on screen. Now, the results here are pretty interesting. What you can see here is that the case where the two traces are connected with a single via had the worst thermal performance in terms of temperature. When you use two vias and three vias, the situations are actually very similar. The difference between a single via and the two via case is about 15 degrees, whereas the difference between the two vias and the three vias case is only about six degrees. Now, this is interesting because what it's showing is that adding two vias doesn't necessarily double the temperature reduction from the single via case. We we actually get diminishing returns. And at some point, as we keep adding more and more vias beyond three vias for this connection, we would expect smaller and smaller reductions in that temperature until eventually we just equalize the temperature across the two traces. We can see here that in the three via connection, there's only a six degree difference between the top and the bottom trace. So who cares? That's small enough that it's really not gonna affect anything in a practical design. Now, the reason this is so surprising is that if you actually calculate the cross-sectional area of each of these traces and then calculate the number of vias that you need to reach the same cross-sectional area, you'll find that you would actually need 14 vias. Now, 14 vias is a lot of vias for a trace-to-trace -trace connection. And as you can see here, we already get pretty good results with just three vias. So I think this underscores one of the points that the authors made at the beginning of the article, which is that people are probably using too many thermal vias. Now, the first two simulations in this article show what happens with traces. And in particular, the second simulation actually looks at vias and shows that adding vias does help transfer heat, but only up to a certain point. Beyond a certain number of vias, you get diminishing returns. What happens when we do the same thing, but with pads? Well, that's what they looked at in simulation number three in the article. Now here on screen, we're looking at a situation where we have a pad that is heated up with two watts of power continuously. And they look at two situations. First, they have the pad just sitting on bare FR4, no other copper. And then they have the same pad, but they have it over a ground plane. Now here the results basically show something similar as to what we saw in the first simulation. Here on the left are the temperature profiles for the top and bottom layer of the PCB when there is no plane, just a pad being heated up at two watts. You can see here that the temperature of the pad reaches 90 degrees and the temperature on the bottom side of the PCB reaches 87 degrees, pretty much as expected. And you can see that the thermal profile of the pad is nicely telegraphed onto the bottom layer of the FR4. Now, when we add in the plane, you can see that the temperature of the pad drops significantly from 90 degrees down to 45 degrees. And you can see on the bottom side of the PCB with the plane that the bottom side of the PCB is now 38.78 degrees. Again, this this jives with what was seen in simulation number one, as well as the remarks from Mike Jopi. Just adding in the plane is enough to help remove heat from that heat source and distribute it throughout the rest of the PCB. But remember, there are no thermal vias in this hypothetical pad. Now, 
what happens to this pad when we add in some thermal vias? Well, that's what they looked at in their final simulation in this article. Now you can see here in this simulation that they've added in two thermal vias and by adding in those two thermal vias, there is a small local reduction in temperature, as you can see from this color map. But what they're showing is that the reduction in temperature is only a single degree. So initially, it looks like just adding in a couple of thermal vias doesn't really produce much of an effect. Now, the explanation for this result is pretty straightforward. What they say is that the presence of the plane already reduced the thermal gradient so much that adding in some additional low thermal resistance elements, namely thermal vias, doesn't really produce much greater effect. Now, I'm skeptical that we can make such a broad generalized statement just from placement of two vias in a pad that are spaced far apart from each other because the size of the vias and the spacing of the vias should also have an effect on the heat transfer efficiency from the hot pad into the cool plane. Now, I don't think the simulation results by these guys are wrong. I just think that their study is frankly incomplete because they didn't look at the effect of the size of the vias, the number of the vias, and the spacing between the vias on heat transfer efficiency. So for that, I had to look into the literature and I did find one really great article from this group of authors, as you can see on screen, and they've published this in IEEE Transactions on Power Electronics in 2020. In this study, the authors looked at the arrangement of vias, the size of the vias, and the spacing between the vias, and they developed a pretty extensive mathematical model describing this situation and how it affects heat transfer between a pad and a plane, or between a pad and a heat sink. Now, this paper has a lot of results in it, and of course, we don't have time to go through the entire paper, and as you can see here on screen, it is a 20-page paper. But there are two really important figures that I wanna call attention to in this video. Now, the first figure is shown here in figure two. In figure two, the authors are plotting the normalized thermal resistance as a function of via to via spacing and the via diameter. So the parameter here in these graphs is the diameter of the via. Now, when the authors write normalized thermal resistance, they're looking at the thermal resistance of the path between the pad on the bottom of an integrated circuit and the heat sink or plane connected by thermal vias related to the thermal resistance of just bare FR4 with no additional copper. So that's basically the thermal resistance that they measure divided by the thermal resistance with just FR4. And as you can see here, when the via to via spacing is very small, the thermal resistance also gets very small. Similarly, when the vias are very large, we also see that the thermal resistance gets very small. Now what this result shows is that by taking your vias and clustering them closer together, you can get much greater heat transfer efficiency from the heat source into your plane or heat sink. It's still an open question whether or not the results in the iConnect article would be significantly affected by placing one of the optimized via arrangements that they derive in this article. The next result that I wanna look at is shown here on screen in figure four. Now, figure four is showing what happens to the normalized thermal resistance as a function of the via diameter when we have different filler materials between the PCB and a heat sink. So it's not exactly the situation that the authors in the iConnect article looked at, but it is actually important because it illustrates that there is an optimal via diameter and via spacing that produces the minimum thermal resistance. I think this is important because one of the planes in the situation in the iConnect article could have easily been replaced with a heat sink and a thermal interface material, which would then match closely to the situation that's examined in the IEEE article. Again, it's still an open question as to whether or not the authors in the iConnect article would have seen an even lower temperature of their pad when they used one of these optimized via configurations shown in the IEEE article. So what's the verdict on the iConnect article? Well, in my opinion, the iConnect article is just incomplete. They didn't really look at enough situations in order to make really definitive generalized statements about thermal vias. It appears from the IEEE article that thermal vias are effective when used in the appropriate number and in the appropriate spacing. This is something that wasn't sufficiently investigated in the iConnect article, so I would ignore this proposition that thermal vias are inefficient or unnecessary. I think they are necessary, you just have to determine the right number and size to use in your PCB.
Thanks for watching this video, everybody. And thank you, Marco, for the great question. And if any of you viewers out there have a good question, make sure to leave it in the comments section. Don't forget to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to call your fabricator, folks. We'll see you next time. Yeah.